Welcome, everyone, to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner. They call me Wolf. They being my friends, um, those people being named Arash and Barton. That's pretty much it. I don't really claim anyone else as a friend. Sorry, my friend's list is full. Don't have time. Can't do it. Just kidding. I have a lot of friends. Everyone's my friend. Even the enemies I hate, I just call them lesser friends, right? <laughs> friends with disagreements. Friends, friends with disagreements. There you go. Enemy uh, is just a friend who hasn't submitted to me yet. Yeah, everybody is just like uh, uh, people with political differences. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a show. It's a continuation from last Tuesday. We're going to keep it short and sweet because we got a lot to talk about on the intro here. I had to go into like a long-winded uh, sort of explanation and kind of give you the backstory because this is kind of the beginning of the UAP. And uh, we're going to be doing this off and on for a while. We're going to be bringing on guests that are, are associated with the UFO phenomena field, whatever. UAP to me, like I've said before, is not just unidentified aerial phenomena. It's unidentified alien presence. And that's what it means to me. Just like my definition of, of paranormal is not everyone else's definition of paranormal. I just think it's anything that's not of the of the mainstream norm. Uh, with me, as always, are my esteemed colleagues. Oh, wait. There's no esteemed colleagues, but we have Anthony and Tony here. I'm esteemed. You, you think you are. No, but, you I, know, I cooked some broccoli this morning. I've been steamed up all night. <laughs> and I, I took a hot shower. So. Yeah, well, that, there you go. I mean, you know, it's not as healthy as a cold shower, but whatever. And so if you want to be weak and take all that warm showers, you go ahead. I take cold ones. But here's what I'm going to tell you, folks. It works. Keeps you looking young. I mean, you can't argue with results. I want to say this, and I want to say it now, okay? If you want to help the show, like and subscribe please like and subscribe if you want to help the show further donate during the chat you can donate during the chat of this show you can donate during the super chats you can do that during the live streams now you gotta check out the live streams fridays and sundays fridays we always have a guest comes on about 8 30 p.m central and then 7 to 7 30 p.m central on sundays we don't have a guest but we talk and we, we retell people's encounters which is what we're doing tonight because this is tuesday and tuesday if you're listening to us on Spotify, uh, welcome. If you're listening to us on one of the other 14 platforms, welcome. And if you're on YouTube, welcome. Uh, Thursday, we have another uh, episode with a guest, and it'll be a continuation with our, um, our our guy that we had on, Eddie. And he'll be talking about his Bigfoot encounters, and we get into all kinds of stuff. Uh, so every Tuesday and Thursday, we drop an hour-long show. Tuesdays, we, we tell stories. Thursdays for guests, and then of course Friday is for guests on the live stream on YouTube exclusive, and then Sunday YouTube exclusive. We tell we retell people or tell uh, encounter. Excuse me, we retell people's encounters. We retell them. That being said, uh, Patreon. We have the Patreon, a ten dollar, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollar tier. It's a really good way to support the show, and probably the best way. And it gives you a swag bag after two months. From $10 to $20 is measured virtually the same. You get an autographed book with a little bit swag. Uh, $30, you get more swag. You get a, probably a shirt, I think, right? Is that what we're doing? Or a cap? Yeah. And then you get, like, I think both or something when you get to 50 or something like that. And then the 40, you get, like, you get the same. You get all the books. You get, like, an autographed book from one of the authors. When you get to the $30 tier, you get two books, right? And yeah. then $40 yeah. tiers, you get one of their books and one of mine. $50 tiers, you get both of mine and one of theirs. So it's a really good deal. So join the $50 tier, folks, if you can do it and for two months. And then after that, you get a, a great uh, swag bag. Wait, by the way, the, the guest name from this past Thursday, his name is Ernie. Ernie. No, it's, it's Ernie, not I Eddie. I said Ernie. You said Eddie. I know what I said. I know what you said. I stand you, by what I said, even if I said Eddie. I don't care. I said Ernie in my mind. You don't have a recording of okay. it. You can't prove anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, exactly what he said. Look, Ernie, Eddie, he knows me. He knows who I am. It's Ernie okay. over here, all right? It's, it's Ernie. If I didn't say Ernie, which I fully believe you're lying, just trying to trip me up, then I apologize to Eddie. I mean, Ernie. All the listeners... <laughs> All y'all got to do is just rewind this a few minutes. Okay, and we don't need to rewind I will anything. will be vindicated. Ignore this man behind the like counter who always, is disrupting the show. Like always. Who is all, yes, Tony, is he always disrupting the show, right? I'm always vindicated uh, is what I'm, I'm, I'm always. Relaxing. Oh, my gosh. 
Well, well, Tony's got his Christmas present in tow. He's over here. Oh yeah, he's over there massager. relaxing with a neck massager. He doesn't That's care about nice. Really nice. While we're arguing over Ernie and Eddie, Ernie, I apologize for this man. He's just trying to obfuscate and I think confuse. I'm trying to tell he the truth. He somehow heard Eddie in his head, Ernie, and I don't really understand how that worked. Or, uh, and Eddie. Okay, I mean, well then Ernie. you're insulting all the listeners too because you're I calling them stupid. I'm not insulting my wonderful listeners. I'm just not agreeing I with you. I just don't appreciate you insulting this guest like well, that. Well, the listeners, exactly. well, the listeners agree with me because they have a brain. And you know, they, they everyone would have skipped right over it's it. It's right there. Yeah, on, no one would have cared. It's right you, there You recorded. really focused and pointed it out and put shame on this poor man. Well, he needs to tell the truth. <laughs> Ernie. I apologize once again for this guy. I'm glad that you're going to be on I Thursday. I apologize. You couldn't be bothered to remember your name. <sighs> I'm going to do Zane now. <sighs> whatever. <sighs> Completely wrong, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, SpongeBob, there's a time and a place for nothing. <laughs> and here it is. I'm walking. All right, folks. So Ernie, Eddie, potato, potato. Anyways, he's going to be on with us again on Thursday. Check it out. So that being said, we're going to move on to the stories that we have to get to. When we uh, left off last time, we were talking about a guy named Keith. Uh, I'm not going to say his last name. I always just almost slip up there. I don't, want to, I don't know if I had permission from his family. He has two children, and one of them is a real estate agent, and he's a really good kid. Uh, well, he's not a kid anymore. He's, he's older than Anthony. But yeah, and, and so he's a good guy, and I did talk to him. I talked to him, and one of the things that he told me, because I didn't get but the story from his grandmother about his grandmother, but one time. But this guy, his son, knew her. Okay, that was his great grandmother, and he knew her until he was about eleven. All right, so she died in her nineties. Now you got to remember, farm folks back in the day, they ate healthy. They were built for tough. They were built for it. There was no. There you go. Four well, times. there was no organic back then. There, it, That's it, just it, what it was. That's yeah. just what food was. It was just normal. Yeah. Yeah. They drank milk straight out of the teat. They drank, uh, uh, you know, milk and, and they they canned, you know, fruits and vegetables. As well. They lived correctly. They ate fresh, you know, animals, that, you know. And they chore from, you know, sunrise or sun up to sundown. So their bodies are just healthy. Yeah, she lived to be 98 years old. So, and, and he said that right up until the last decade or so of her life, she was out working, like doing stuff. They couldn't get her to stop. Now, you know, of course, Hernandez Ranch with Abel, I mean, like, you know, him and his brother, they lived to be very old, um, you know, and that's because they lived their whole lives out on the farm. You know, his brother died on his tractor. He was like 89 years old or something like that. Um, so so that that's, you know, people lived longer and healthier and and, you know. It's, there was a reason for it, you know? Of course, you would look at their diet and think, oh, their diet was horrible because they ate a lot of animal fat and they ate a lot of, you know, different stuff. But, you know, th they were still healthier. They didn't have the chemical process stuff that we have. But so anyways, his mother, uh, his, or his grandmother had given him a ride shortly after they went to town and we had talked about that. And one of the things that she told Keith, she said, you know, I had seen – a, a spaceship, she called them spaceships. She said, I saw a spaceship one time flying really low over the treetops years ago when I was with my best friend Agnes and we were driving. And she's like, and I just see this thing go over the treetops. And then it, it like kind of went over the top of their car and was gone up into the sky. And the way she described it was the spinning image of what Keith had seen that day with his brother. Well, we talked about what his brother had, had happened but what we didn't talk about, and something that he, that Keith's uh, one son told me, he said, you know, my dad had often talked about these encounters he had. He's like, I had my own encounter with something. He didn't know what it was. Uh, it was like a shadow person. And it was just like, it was something that he saw moving along the wall when he was a child. And it was in that house. And he said, that house was notoriously haunted. And I said, you know, and all the conversations I had with your dad, uh, we were at our ashes bar one time and we were talking and our Ash was a part of this conversation, and we talked about shadow people. I said, and one of the conversations that we had was about shadow people. Um, his younger brother, Jeremy, saw them quite frequently, where Keith, I think he said it was like maybe twice. He saw like a shadow moving independent. It wasn't anything amazing. One time it was around Christmas time, and he said that this thing, he saw the Christmas tree fall over, and he thought it was a cat, one of the cats that would come in and out of the house. And he said, for some reason, they had a really mean tomcat named Tom, and it would just come in and out of the house. 
they would fight with their weenie dog. They had a wiener dog. He said that they had a funny name like Shaw or something like that. And it would fight with the dog and then run out. And then, because people don't realize that weenie dogs are actually pretty, pretty tough little dudes, man. We had one. And so anyway, he thought that they were fighting and it, the tree had tumped over. And then he looks and he sees this black shadowy looking figure that had what he described as like small horns and it had pushed the tree over. Now, Keith told me that story. So I, I often wondered, you know, and, and I've talked to, you know, with my brother about this and when the scorpion was with me and R. Ash, we were all talking to him one day because he had played a gig at R. Ash's bar and it was probably the last time I'd seen him. And he mentioned, you know, ghosts and stuff like that because that bar was haunted and so we had this whole conversation about it, and he did say that he believed that his house was haunted, and it was prior to running into those three dogman type creatures that came out of what you know looked like a craft. And I asked him, I said, Keith, do you think it had anything to do with one another? One of the things he told me that I thought was interesting was that he said, yes, he did, because and in his opinion, which I, my opinion mirrors his, is that why would there, why would you live in a house and have land that had weird stuff happening and then, you know, it not be connected? It just doesn't make sense. When he was young and he was out shooting, uh, he was, uh, you know, out looking for chicken snakes. Back then, there were no rattlesnakes in Central Texas. I don't know if it's a Mandela effect or what, but they just kind of showed up and then all of a sudden they were there. When I was a child, you didn't have to worry about rattlesnakes and, and uh, in the black land of Taylor. You didn't have to worry about that black soil. They didn't have, we had chicken snakes. That's it. We didn't have rattlesnakes. And then one day, oh, there's rattlesnakes. And they're like, oh, they've always been here. But I don't remember that. And none of the old timers do either. You go out to our farm out there in Taylor, my Uncle Butch's farm. We didn't have rattlesnakes out there. But then when they tore the old house down, there was like a whole pit of them underneath the house. It was like 50 of them. So, you know, and it was right there back where Clayton and, and Trey's bedroom would have been. You know, which I spent many a night, you know, asleep in that room, you know, and, and hanging out and whatever, growing up out there. When you go back and you look at where he was living, um, you don't get a lot of people getting bit by rattlesnakes or anything like that. But he was out, you know, looking for snakes and he came across a huge, huge rattlesnake that was about six foot long. And get this, him and his brother walked up to this tree that had what it looked like green moss all over it. And it was out in the middle of their neighbor's land where the neighbors were cool, you know, and they would let them go and they would shoot. And he said, our neighbors were just, they, they were an elderly couple and their, their children had all moved on and they didn't really, they had a defunct farm and, and they would just kind of be charitable and let them have food and stuff like that. And so they went over there and they gave them eggs and, you know, once or twice a week, their children would come by and check on them. Um, and then they would kind of like hook them up because they're, they had a store in town, you know, and they were around, but they didn't live out there, you know? And so they, because of their generosity, they would just be really kind and they would share food and everything. So he said, we were out there and we were wandering onto their property and there was this tree that, that in the moonlight, it glowed green. And he said that one night it was just glowing. And so we went over to the tree and we're like, it was just glowing so, so steadfast, you know, he was in the middle of summer, you know, we went out there. He goes, we run around and barefooted out there, you know. And he's like, and we stumbled upon this humongous rattlesnake, which was an oddity to us because we didn't have rattlesnakes out there. And I remember as a kid not having them. We had copperheads and, and uh, rattlesnakes out in Rockdale, but not in that, in that sandy land, not in that black land. But now we have them. So he goes out there to that tree, and at the base of it, there's this huge uh, rattlesnake that's wrapped around it that's over six foot long. And he thought it was really odd, and it just slithered up to them and then sat up real high and then tried to strike, and he shot it. And uh, he took it, and he hung it over the fence, and he had it for a long time, and then the coyotes came and grabbed it and, and absconded with it. But uh, it was one of the really weird things that happened, and now – the grandmother who, you know, Keith and them, that belonged to her husband, and he had died, you know, when he was younger. He died in his, like, 60s um, of an accident. Um, he fell off of his tractor and something happened, and then he ne and then it broke his back and never recovered. And, of course, back then, you know, being a paraplegic or, you know, it just wasn't 
you know, there was a death sentence. You weren't going to live that long because they yeah. didn't have the same kind of, you know, advantage that you know. And so he probably would have lived a lot longer, but uh, having died the way he did. So one of the things that, that, that he and his brother and his dad and his mother, they, they took over that house. The grandmother lived with them until she was, you know, really, really into her late, uh, like I said, 90s. And she always said that the house was haunted, but that after her husband had passed away, she would see him sometimes. And Keith and his brother were no exception. One day, them, them two and their little sister were walking down the stairs, and it was like Easter Sunday, and they were getting ready. And they see this guy in the mirror, looking at himself in the mirror, like facing the mirror. Um, and it was their grandfather. Like he was in the mirror facing the opposite direction and they could see him. Huh. What was it he was, just doing? Huh? He was just looking like he was l- looking at himself getting ready, hmm. had on a suit and everything. And they were just like, it was a very weird thing. Now his son uh, told me, Clint told me some really weird things. He told me like there were multiple incidents there. And one time he saw what looked like what he described as a green eyed glowing demon like creature in the window. He said it looked human like, but it had a, like hair all over its face and the eyes were white. Like the, they were like the eyes would be rolled back in the head. Yeah. And it had like these pointy, as he described them, floppy ears on the side of its head. And it had these weird looking enormous sideburns. And he said, and it just looked like, he said it kind of looked like a goofy, a wolfman type creature, you know, like the wolfman. And it was even wearing like a plaid and uh, red and black shirt, which he thought was, you know, weird. And, and it was just kind of standing there staring at him, but it looked almost zombified and had these big bottom teeth. And him and his brother were there looking at it. And then it was, just, they went and ran out of the room and then they came back and it was gone. Their uncle who stayed with them for a little while, he went around the house. They didn't see anything. And that was the end of it. But their uncles and their aunts and all had stories of growing up in that house. And, of course, Keith, you know, and his brother, uh, Jeremy, um, they talked about it, you know, and they had cousins that would come over and everybody was like, oh, this house is haunted, this house is haunted, you know. And uh, a lot of, he had a lot of cousins. He had one um, uncle, Keith did, that had uh, eight children. So he had a lot of cousins and they would come over and, of course, you know, he was very uh, fond of that uncle. He got along with him very well. That that guy moved on to Waco and ended up becoming very wealthy and had, I guess, invested like in Dr. Pepper or something like that <laughs> and ended up making a lot of money. Smart idea. Yeah, because it used to be bottled like in Dublin or something, and, and he actually lived out there. And so we've covered some stories in that area of Heiko. And uh, his uncle had a weird uh, dog man encounter, something that was crossing the road uh, near Dublin one time when he was coming back from Waco. And I guess I guess there was like a bottling plant or something they had opened up in Waco or something. They had moved it to Waco. I don't remember the whole story. But they were moving stuff, and one of the workers had a truck. And according to what Keith's son told me, they hit something. And when they got out on the side of the road was this wolf-like creature and it looked like it was mangled. Right before their eyes, it just kind of like twisted and turned and then sat up and then ran into the woods. And there was no blood. Although it did dent the crap out of the, the front of one of those big trucks. So, and this was a truck that was like hauling like, you know, supplies and stuff. So it was big. And um, he said his uncle always talked about that, you know, and, and in relation to what he had seen. He says, I think I saw one of these things one time. And he was kind of like driving with a convoy. And so that was interesting. I thought that that was, you know, something that needed to be talked about. But his grandmother, having seen the the spacecraft when she was a young girl, when she was like, you know, in her late teens, she also had an encounter down by the creek um, with what she described. She was picking what we here in Central Texas call dewberries. Now they're just blackberries, but that's what we call them. We call them dewberries and they grow wild along with Mustang grapes. They'll grow on trees like vines wrapped around trees and you'll see them wrapped around barbed wire fences and you can make some really good wine my grandmother used to make it so she was out like uh, picking mustang grapes and dewberries and hanging out in the pasture there was a creek that ran through there and apparently there was a creature that was down drinking um from the the creek and right before her eyes along with her two sisters 
Her sister Mary said, do you see what I see? And they look and they see this creature and it's using its front paws, which where should have been paws were hands, and it was putting water into its mouth. When it noticed them, it stopped, kind of looked both ways, stared back at them, just stood there for a long while and contemplated and then just kept drinking the water. I guess it assumed that they weren't a threat. And they took off walking slowly away at first and then running back up the hill and getting away from that bottom area. When she got back to her house and told her dad what had happened, uh, this was his grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And this would have been way back in the day, you know, like just years ago. He said that his grandmother was like, I think it was like possibly turn of the century, you know, 19, early 1900s, whatever. And told, he, did, she's like, you, I had to take a strap to you because I told you before not to be going down there. There's a reason. And I guess his, their grand, their, he would have been his great, great grandfather, but Keith's great grandfather knew, he knew. And this was about 12 miles from their farm where they grew up, that these creatures existed. And they've always been here in Central Texas. Now, Georgetown would be in, in that particular area. It's outside of Georgetown. But it would have been interesting because, you know, Interspace Caverns is there. Oh, yeah. And, and and it's all cave systems from there all the way to Leander up there, like by close to where you live, Tony. And and so, you know, me and Eric Palacios, like I had mentioned him, you know, in the last episode about the beast, uh, what's it called? The Beast uh, of Brushy Creek? Yeah, Beast of Brushy Creek. Because Brushy Creek runs through there. Now, this creek would have been an offshoot of Brushy Creek. Now, if you go back to the to the story of, I uh, forgot the guy's name. Um, we interviewed him, and then we, we retold his story. He was uh, homeless, and it was off of that 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 uh, highway, um, and he and it was fight for your life or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot his name. The guy I can't remember his name, but uh, we interviewed him. He was an African American guy. Yeah, and he was up in a tree, mm-hmm. and these things had cornered him, and he literally had made a makeshift spear. And um, I, you know, it, and that that highway from Leander to uh, Georgetown, and it would have been in that area, and where where her farm was. Now, when you take, when you look at a map, that whole area is inundated with caves. And like Eric had said, I think he said it on the show when he was on the show. If you go back and listen to his episodes, um, you know, he, he has a, a unique perspective on it being a filmmaker and everything. Kind of like Garitano, you know, they, 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 they look at things a, a, like a lot differently than we do and very creative people. But he was saying that there's caves all in those ranches out there. And there's places where no one goes because those ranches have belonged to those families since the 1800s. Yeah. And so, you know, there's little plots of land that were absorbed and then sold and, you know, and then sold to developers, which we worked along that highway. And we would hear all kinds of weird stuff. I worked out there one night and I heard there was like four different builders out there. And I heard what sounded like a baboon screeching out there. And I'm like, what is that? And me and Nelly were just stumped because it didn't, next thing you know, we hear all these coyotes and it's like they were fighting with some kind of screeching primate, which I can't even tell you what that was. Um, but uh, maybe Nelly remembers that. Uh, I'm sure she does. But, you know, it's, that whole area just does not surprise me that this this stuff was going on. You know, so, you know, Keith's son his great great grandfather had told his grandmother, or his great grandmother, whatever, that you know that those things had been there for a long time. He's like, you leave them alone, don't mess with them, and whatever you do, don't shoot them because they don't die. So that's terrifying. But think about this: if the cave system theory is to be believed, then that means that that they came from the inner earth or some level thereof. Now, when Joe Barger was on um, Linda Moulton House show. He talked on, of course, he told his story. We're going to get him to come on and talk on the podcast and, and tell some information, you know. And, um, he's been on the live stream. He shot and killed one of these things, allegedly, right? He was on Linda Moulton House show. And then at the end of the show, Linda, Linda talked about my book, of course. And then at the end of the show, she talks about the inner earth and how there are multiple levels of alien species living within the earth. Now, I had a conversation this morning with, with a friend of ours about the Bible. He's a, he's a, he's into the Bible and he's read the Quran and he's read all these holy books like me and he's going to be coming on the show in a couple months. And so we were going over some things, we we're hashing some things out. And one of the things he talked about was, you know, how the inner earth is mentioned multiple times within all these holy books. Uh, most significantly in the book of Job. Then of course, in Revelations, it talks about 
those will be judged living upon and within the earth. So no one's going to escape judgment, right? Well, what and who are these beings that live within the earth? Who can really say what we're dealing with, what these things are, who they are? Um, but if this story is to be believed that happened to Keith, me and my brother's friend, you got to wonder, you know, if this was a craft, what if it didn't come from outer space? What if it came from inner earth? And the funny thing is, those caverns there, which you can go and explore and visit and right there in Georgetown, they're called the inner space caverns, which is interesting. I mean, when you start kind of putting it all together, it's something that me and Eric had talked about. I've gone over this with David Weatherly. A lot of these things are found around cave systems. And in fact, surprise, surprise, the story from last Tuesday, Jeff and Sarah's story, there was a cave that's only about maybe a half mile from where they saw the the big light that split up into five pieces twice in the 60 days apart. That cave, it, it was talked about in Burt Wall's book where they had cornered the goat man. Now, of course, I've said this before, Burt claims in the book uh, that they shot and killed, not him, but the old timer shot and killed a goat, goat that was killing the the, the cattle. Now, the people out there, though, told me a different story. Uh, talking to some people from the bar out there, they said that that's not correct, that it was a goat-like man creature, but that Bert wasn't comfortable putting it in the book that way. So the locals tell a different story, but I know what Bert was doing. He's writing a book about ghosts, you know, and it's already, and this is way back in the day, you know, he's already going to look kind of, well, you know, it was the early nineties, whatever. Not everybody was the same back then. It was like, oh yeah, you saw, you saw that, huh? huh? Are you crazy? Um, you know, as time goes on, we get a little more liberal with it, you know, but back then the, the thinking was more conservative. I don't mean in a political sense. I mean, in like the thinking of like, like open-minded and set in your ways. Yeah. Because the nut houses had just been closed down a decade before. <laughs> so hadn't been that long. People were still remembering, like you talk about weird stuff, you might get sent to an Arkham, you know, yeah. or, or Bellevue, whatever it's called. You know? So, I mean, you, you're, you're sitting there going like, you know, this is, you know, so Bert's probably going, Hey, you know, I think this is my opinion. Okay. Um, I don't want his estate to come after me or whatever, but I'm going to tell you what I think Bert was doing and having read his books years ago. I think he was just saying goat. It was a goat rather than saying goat man because it just seemed like, okay, I'm already telling you these stories of ghosts. Now I got to try to get you to believe, you know, um, back in the 90s, you know, that this was a goat man, which we know people have seen near Purgatory Road out there by the cemetery. Uh, one of the people from the Hernandez Ranch saw it and they were like, nope, it was the wife of Joe. And he was like, no, no, no. What I saw was not a, a, a wolf-like creature. She's like, I've seen that. Those I know what those look like. This was a goat, a black goat man carrying a deer, a stag head. Now, it threw it toward their SUV. So that being said, you know, th think about it. The cave system was right there. And, of course, there was this UFO, which is an unidentified flying object. We don't know what it was. And then they see this werewolf-type creature on the trail. I mean, you know, and, and then the average UFO researcher is going to take that as a UFO report. They're not going to want to hear anything about a cave, a goat, or a goat man. They don't want to hear about a werewolf. They just want the UFO. Yeah, thank it's going to isolate the slam, bam. Thank you. That's it. You know, they want to. Yeah, they want to isolate and pick apart that. The dog man researcher doesn't care about the UFO. Doesn't care about the goat. Doesn't. All they want to know is the werewolf. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Make, it, uh, make a sandwich, but only eat, eat the tomatoes. That's right. That kind of compartmentalization is why like some of the some of the most notorious serial killers were able to go from like state to state and just do what they do because these these departments weren't working, working together. together. And it's the same a new case every time. Yeah, and and it's it's the same with this paranormal community. It's like if if everything's compartmentalized, you're cutting yourself off from answers. Well, you know, back in the day, and I'm not talking about a long time ago, just when I was a kid, you know, you could commit a crime in Milam County, and as long as you left that county and didn't go back, you're fine. Yeah. You could go to, like, you know, Williamson County, and you're you're like, well, Williamson County, probably not, but <laughs> you could go to another county and probably not be messed with, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not even looking. I mean, you know, because I, I heard of, of, of people doing things in, like, Hayes County, and then just going to Bear County, and then that's it. Nobody's ever even picked up on it. Um, you know, 
you just didn't want to do certain things where the federal government would look at you because then they, it was nationwide, you know, like rob a bank or something. But if you did something like assaulted somebody or something, you could more than likely just cross county lines. I mean, and, and just think about it, a lot of these murdering bastards, they would cross state lines to go and do what they did. I mean, Samuel Little, look him up. I mean, that's he even said it himself in that interview, like the lead singer from, or no, the lead guitarist from Weezer, his wife interviewed him on that Netflix special where he, you know, the compartmentalization is what did it. Like he was able to go from state to state, you know, choking women and doing what he did. And and it was because of that. I mean, he got away with it. He goes, these, these departments don't work together. You know I mean? Like you're sitting there thinking the whole time, you know, this guy would have gotten caught, but he kept traveling from state to state, you know, and he would kill, kill people in, in one state and then go to the next state and they didn't work together. So it's pretty obvious what was going on. And so what you're saying is very correct. The compartmentalization is the downfall of our community because in truth, the UFO, ghost, uh, and Bigfoot community are all one. The cryptids, everything, it's all connected. And that's one thing that we're trying to do is, is, is connect you know, the pieces back together. Mm-hmm, unification. And it all goes back, as far as I'm concerned, to history and science, and, it, and it le- the roads lead back to ancient civilizations. If people would understand history, which has been lost on people, then you would be able to make serious inroads into the truth. And I also think- Which we do a lot on the live stream. People take for granted, really, what we have today. I mean, we all do it to a lesser degree, some more than others, but when you really think about the span of human history and what we've accomplished today- you know, despite outside factors, whatever they may be, you have to realize like everything we have today was built on the minds and deaths of like million, countless people. It's an accumulated knowledge that have led us to this path where we are today. So you can't like look at this and like look at knowledge coming from a different source of what, than what you know and kind of shun it or look at it like, Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy or because that's like you're kind of spitting on your ancestors when you do that because it was that competition. It was that like, you know, that drive to either figure something out or, or build something or make something better that led us to where we are today. It led us to all the innovations that we have right now. So to sit there and t- say you have it wrong and, and what you're saying is incorrect or, or you don't know what you're talking about without actually being able to challenge those ideas it is kind of shameful in my eyes. You know, it, it, it kind of just makes me look down on you. Well, um, sorry you feel that way. So anyways, <laughs> like we were saying, uh, no, nah, I get it. I get what you're saying. So yeah, getting back to the story, I think that what we're, you know, like dealing with, with this house, uh, was it like a magnet or a beacon that led these beings there or was it just, it was just there? And it just happened, and it just they just happened to stop there for whatever reason. To That's do what's always was. weird. Is like, is it the chicken or the egg? Like, what what caused the other to happen? You know, because it could have been that like it was something that was dormant, it wasn't really doing anything, and this other activity caused it to start acting up as well. Or it could be that because this thing came, or because this thing was here, that's why these other ones came. Or you know, like it's hard to say. Like for what reason or objective they have to where, why there's always so much activity in one spot and you can't, I I, want to be able to figure out like, is it the aliens that are doing it or is it because there are ghosts in the area that these aliens are coming by to study them? Is it something like that? Like I want to know like which one is causing the other or do they have no, Connection. Relation at all. Well, on the live stream, we had a story that we told. Uh, it was a, a young lady. Well, she's older now, but she was a young lady at the time. And she was seeing this weird, white, ghostly looking feminine entity that looked demonic with like fangs. And then she looks out that in the window and there's these grays that are kind of staring at it like they're observing it which is most disturbing. I mean, you know, it's bad enough that you're seeing, you know, that, but then there's something there in the window that's treating you like a lab rat and they're looking at it, you know? And then there was another story that we had gotten from somebody, I believe it was a guy. Um, and something had kind of like come out of the, out of the, like a cube or something, if I'm remembering correctly. And it was like, these aliens were watching it and, and whatever it was that came out of there, it looked like this sort of alien 
from the the movie Aliens, you know. Like a xenomorph? xenomorph? Yeah, like, do you remember that? And it attacked one of those aliens. I don't yeah. remember the whole no. story. Oh, you mean the, um, wasn't it the... Uh, was that on the live stream or was that on the podcast? I thought that was a podcast. Wasn't it the one where those three aliens were coming into this guy's yeah, room? Yeah, the guy, they kept coming to his room and then one of them was attacked and oh, killed and this, by this... like nightmare thing. Yeah, this creature that, they that couldn't came out of there. They couldn't like, see it. Yeah. yeah, that was on the podcast. Yeah, so you what go back and... the Sentinel? The, oh, Sentinel, the Sentinel, yeah, yeah that's right. So when you when you get these stories, and of course you guys have heard some stories that, that we've been given that just make your flesh crawl, mm-hmm. and you you know like the thing coming out. Of, well, I, we haven't talked about that one yet. We'll talk about that one on the live stream. But there was this one where this lady was working late in this building here in Austin. It, the building is here in Austin, and this thing would come up like a shadow up out of the carpet, and it would creep toward her. And one day it grabbed her by the leg and started to pull her into this black spot that which kind of was. Like she could put her leg into the, into the spot, like all the way to her knee. But it was like, by the laws of physics, that shouldn't be happening. And this thing didn't really have appendages. It just like two offshoots from this black sludge or whatever it was grabbed her. Um, And as she said, it felt spongy, which we've heard that before. We've heard people have even saying that they've bitten these things. Like it, it was like a sponge. And then, but anyway, she went down into the floor and she began to scream. And luckily one of the janitors was on the floor and came running up and he, he saw it. And of course he doesn't speak any English, but he, you know, was cognizant. He's like, Hey, you know, you don't have to know English to see somebody's in trouble. She couldn't communicate with him, but he pulled her away from it. And of course, you know, the next day he quit. And so did she. (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) Yeah. But, uh. Yeah, I don't care, man. I mean, like, you know, even if I'm from another country and I need to, to feed my family, whatever, I'll find another There's way. I'll guns. sell it at Lope or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be working in that building, but I know the building she's talking about, and I knew some people who did security there, and they had talked about seeing this black shadow This that one of the field captains where I used to work years ago had told me that at that building, there was this shadow that would float around the ground. Well, I saw something similar to that when I was working at the Haunted Tower, that one that you labeled the Haunted Tower. Yeah. Anthony. And that particular building, of course, I saw that wolf like entity, but I think it was a mimic. But you think about it, this thing can like create like a black hole, or I don't know what it would be called, like a portal in, with itself and pull you into it. That's a terrifying prospect. And, you know, you, you wonder, like, what, where does this come from? Like, what is that? Where does it lead? You know, and I'll give you another one. This one will be on the live stream too, I'm sure, if I haven't already told it. But it was a security guard in California, uh, in Sacramento. And of course, when we talk about a city or, or an area, somebody will be like, hey, I'm a security guard in that area, and they'll give us a story. It never fails. Well, th- that's what happened. We talked about a security guard in Sacramento hitting one of these wolf-like creatures. Well, here's one for you. The guy was walking through uh, a parking garage, and he was doing his uh, job, and he stopped for a smoke and he leaned up on a wall and he sees what he thinks is a, a shadow moving independently. So he kind of goes to to sit up and he takes notice of it and it quickly moves behind him. And what comes out of the shadows are two shaggy hairy, as he described them, arms. And it begins to try to pull him into the shadow. And he said that happened back in like, I think 1997 or something like that. It was years ago. And he said, dude, I will never forget it, man. And he goes, I always heard that that parking garage was creepy, haunted, whatever. And uh, But he goes, no, it went beyond that. And so anyway, there's a little more to the story. It'll be on the live stream or if it hasn't, it probably already has played on the live stream by the by the time this airs. But yeah, we're going to talk about that. So that that's a that's a weird story, you know, and, you know, you get these stories and they all kind of like mirror one another, you know, like there's these. And and I think the problem and the reason I'm bringing this up is because, you know, we're talking about compartmentalization. A lot of these stories never get told because these researchers, they all want to do the same thing and they all copycat one another. All these shows now, everybody's doing the live stream. Everybody's doing the live stream. You know, you got people who never did the live stream before who one in particular is a terrible host. And now he's like doing the live stream and he sounds like a fish out of water. It just doesn't click. And I actually listened to it the other day and I thought, come on, man. You know, I, you know, I started the show with this and now he's doing paranormal stories or whatever. Now he's doing a live stream and you're going like, come on, dude. And, and people are eating it up. They're just like, oh man, you're so good. Like, yeah, I guess because he, does, yeah. they, they don't listen to it's anybody show, else. No wonder it's good. 
I mean, if you've never heard anything or, or, or eat anything but Wonder Bread, you're going to think it's great. You know, I mean, that's, you know, until you eat like some sourdough or, you know, something else, you know, multi-grain, then you might, oh, wow, there's other types because those people are very closed, narrow-minded. They only want to hear people tell a dog man encounters and that's, that's their thing. And if that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But you're never going to really get down to the, to the bottom of anything. You're just going to, there's not even any real theories being a spouse. It's just, you know, I don't know. And, and it just seems like. You, you know, there's people that are just made to do certain things and that just doesn't go together. You know, peanut butter and jelly goes together. Peanut butter and, you know, rice just doesn't sound appealing to me. What? It <laughs> sounds amazing. <laughs> rice aroni peanut butter flavor. It just, do, you know, it doesn't appeal to me. I'm sorry. So it peanut just butter, salmon, and rice. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Popsicles. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you, when you, you know, you, you got people that, that just, they, they don't, and they don't open up and, and, and talk about more than one subject at a time, even though they're all connected. And they're determined to try to keep it that way because, of course, it is, it, it's a money thing and they're, they're invested in, in you know, in the, and they're going to protect their investment. They want you to listen to that one aspect because that's what they're into. And so they have to keep you coming back. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people fall into that and then they never get anywhere. They just keep spinning their wheels. Well, here at Paranormal Roundtable, we're trying to do more than just have you spin your tires. I mean, we want to get to the to the issues here. And one of the things that I believe with this situation, like with uh, our friend that we're talking about, Keith, he, you know, what he stumbled upon or what, you know, what he came across I think is a lot more prevalent than than we know. And I think over the coming months and years, we're going to be talking about it. I think more people are going to start talking about it. And it's always in this field, monkey see, monkey do. And they're going to start coming forward. And witnesses are going to be like, hey, you know, this happened to me too. And, you know, it never fails. Once we talk about something, people will come forward and, and admit that that has happened to them. Most common occurrence. That's why we can never stop hoarding these stories. I mean, unfortunately, because we, they just keep coming in before we can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we are, are willing to entertain and talk to these people where some of these researchers and podcasters, YouTubers are just not because they don't think that it fits into their narrow paradigm. Uh, one of them in particular, you know, he has a show and it's just, it's just him and a couple other fat guys and they, they're, they're supposedly cops. I don't know if they are, um, the show's terrible and it's boring. I've been on it and I'm, I got the highest amount of views on there, unfortunately. And I'm glad he took it down because I didn't want to be associated with him in any way. And his show is just, the, the, he's like, well, I believe in the evidence. Well, then there's, then you have nothing because there's no evidence. There isn't. Yeah. I mean, what, what, do you, so, and so he doesn't believe in anything woo. He attacks aggressively anything that is not flesh and blood. And even with Dogman, like everything has to be flesh and blood for him. So what would he make of somebody who gives him a story that some sort of shadow tried to pull them, um, which I've gotten multiple sh stories like that. I had something similar to, you know, to that happen to me in a dream, and I, I'm pretty sure it was a dream. But then again, we talked about in the last episode about how dreams can be, be actually be reality. You know, I don't know if, if I I'm, you know, felt like it was a dream. I, I know the difference between um, being in a, in a a dream and, and being like out of your body. So I feel like it was a dream and it was a very scary dream, but we're talking about people who actually have these, uh, in real life, like they're in this reality, you know, just sitting there at your desk doing your job and the shadow tries to pull you into it. Um, freaking heck, man. Do you, do you guys remember the story from a while back about this lady in a nightclub with her friends? And she was just dancing or whatever. And she put her hand against the wall and the wall was like basically eating her her hand and then her friends had to try to pull her out but like they were looking around and no one else yeah. in the nightclub is doing anything kind of reminds me of that yeah yeah and then you you get the, you get these stories that, that come across our, our desks and we go over them and you know in, in, inevitably they're going to tell you at some point they tried to give it to someone else and nobody would take it because they think oh well, this isn't gonna this will make me look crazy or that i'm believing everything you know 
So I do believe that one thing we've done here, not to toot our horns, but I think that we've broken ground in the, in the area of like going further into the ether with the high strangeness where a lot of people won't go because they're, they're, they're scared. They have trepidation. They don't want their audience, but we've, you know, cultivated our audience to be, you know, they're cultured to the point where they know now they're initiated and they understand that the nature of our reality is not what we, this mundane day to day is really, it's the flip side. What I appreciate too about our, our audience is that, you know, I hear, I see it on in the comments all the time. It's, uh, I don't really speak up a little louder. Tom. Uh, I said, uh, what I, what I, I like about our audience is that I hear all the time in the comments, what they'll say is, uh, I don't really agree with this, but you know, it's cool to have them on and I'll listen to, I'll, I'll hear them out. I'll, I'll at least listen to the show. You know, I'll listen to the interview or whatever. And that's always cool because it shows that like, even, even though it's a joke of ours, you're not cult members. You don't follow our every word and you don't yeah. listen and we, you don't have to share our beliefs. And we, I think we've, I, we've tried to make it very important to everyone here that, you know, make your own beliefs, make, choose to believe however you believe, just listen to these stories and don't discount them. Like that's the most important thing is that you have to be open to whatever uh, is going on out there, whatever these people are telling you, because they are real experiences to them. Even if you don't understand them, even if you don't have any like experience with those kind of situations, doesn't mean, doesn't invalidate what they're going through. doesn't invalidate what they believe. So like, you don't really know the harm you do when you kind Make of fun separate it out yeah. or, or just ignore it or be like, oh, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like, yeah, maybe they might be wrong about something, but like, you're never going to know if you don't listen and take them for seriously. And you, you might figure something out yourself. I don't know. I, I, I get a little riled up because it's just, it's holding us back so much. And, you know, I think we've made well, so yeah, many Yeah, and it's invites. holding us back as a community, as a whole. And I think it's a lack of sympathy, too, because, you know, a hundred years ago, if you're mentioning ghosts, you'd probably get burned at, 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 at a stake. Well, not a hundred years ago, but oh, hundreds I mean, of hundreds years, of years ago. ago. Yeah. But, I mean, even there's been a time where every single one of these, you know, groups have been ridiculed, have been, you know, mocked, and have been, been looked down on as... And then now they do the same thing, and then they, they act like all high and mighty, like we're different now. It's like no, and, and it is it is just weird too. Well known now, because the people that I was talking about, the three cops or whatever they are, um, they had on a guy who I'm not too fond of, and he's really big into the woo. And one of the the problems that I believe that the that the leader of those three cops had a problem with me because I espoused too much of what he called the woo, and he told people that. But then he gets together with this other guy that doesn't like me because me and him had a falling out because of my support of the woo. And then he gets that guy on the show and he goes on his show and all they do is talk about the woo. So it's just, and it's, it's just like this clash of egos and beliefs and whatever. And people are guarding their little paradigm and, and their little kingdom. And they don't want their little audience to listen to anything else. They don't want it to expand their minds on anything because it might eat up their, their fame, popularity, their ego, their money. Cause it's all ego and money now, you know, but you know, and that, that is, is bad for the community. And it's something that we would really be talking about in the live stream, but a lot of you on the podcast don't listen to the live stream. So I'm telling you now, but uh, yeah, so let's get back to the stories here. One, one of the things that, that, that I remember hearing about coming off of this uh, uh, area, coming out of this area, on Highway 29, or right off of Highway 29, there was a story that I was given, and I thought it was very interesting. Two ladies were driving along that highway, and they gave me this story after we had uh, the, sh the story about survival, fight for your life, whatever. Yeah. Um, and they, they told us that... <laughs> The, the one the lady's name was Kathy, and she said, we were driving through there back in 1988. She's like, me and my sister, or sister-in-law, and we were driving down the highway, and she's like, we were just talking, laughing, you know, it's it's just a two-lane highway still to this day. And she's like, back then it was nothing. It was just like a little county road, and there was nothing out there. She's like, and we see what looks like two wolf-like creatures on their hind legs jump over a barbed wire fence. And run across the road, 
And she's like, and one of them was carrying what looked like part of a deer carcass over their shoulders. She said about two miles down the road, she were like, whoa, what was that? We were all freaked out. You know, she's like, and we were scared. Our hands were shaking. She's like, I was in the passenger seat. My sister was driving. She's like, and it, it terrified us. She goes, but what was even weirder was about a month before that, she's like, we had a missing time episode, a month after that, I'm sorry, we had a missing time episode. She's like, it was like we were going down that same highway because her uh, cousin or whatever lived in Liberty Hill. And so they were take, they were going down that road and they were taking her home after a get together, like a little, you know, whatever summer get together. She's like, we were heading, you know, down that road and we were getting ready to go onto the the road that goes to, to Liberty Hill. And we had, we were going down that road because one of our friends lived right there when you get to Leander. We were going to drop her off and then go on to Liberty Hill. So there were four ladies there. And she's like, this was like in August. And she said of 1988. And they end up having missing time. They see this, but what it looks like a, a glowing disc in the sky, uh, like started off really high up and it just shot straight down and then went over the top of the car, but not to where they could just look up and it was just like bearing down on them. No, it was still like pretty high up, but she said the next thing, you know, it, it, it was like at nine o'clock at night and it was just getting, it had just gotten dark. And she said, the next thing, you know, it was like 2 AM and I'm driving home and I don't remember anything. And she said, I thought, that's weird. You know, she's like, I'm never taking this road again if I can help it. Because twice she had something weird happen. Once she saw these two wolf-like creatures. And then a month later, uh, she sees this disc with the three ladies. And so she calls each one of them and she asks them, you know, one of them was her sister-in-law. And then one of them was her sister-in-law's cousin. And then one of them was their mutual friend that they had gone to high school with. And she says, we, you know, do y'all remember this or whatever? And each one of them had a different story. And I'll get into that. One of them, Kathy said, the, Brenda, the one, the one lady told her she remembers seeing this like craft and then they pulled over to the side of the road and they were all terrified and there was this enormous amount of heat in the car so that they all got out of the car and began shaking their shirts off like they were drenched in sweat. And then they realized that it was already like midnight. So then they got back in the car and then they went back to Brenda. She's the one that got dropped off in Leander. And then that they talked and then she went on to drop off her friend that lived outside of Liberty Hill. The woman that lived outside of Liberty Hill um, got cancer shortly after that and passed away. And she always thought that it had something to do with that craft going over the top of them. Now, here's the other thing. Each one of them has developed cancer of some kind. Uh, two of them are still alive. Her sister-in-law died back in 1992, which is weird, you know, but not from the cancer. She beat the cancer, but she had some other health problems that developed. And uh, there was a botched surgery that ended up taking her life. And then the other woman, um, she ended up having a stroke. She was like, I think, uh, like 10 years older than them. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's a weird, uh, situation, you know, like it's, I mean, I don't know when you sit back and you look at this, you're going like, uh, how did each one of these people have, you know, and I'm trying to remember which one it was. She said they had the stroke because after she had the stroke, she lingered in the hospital for a while and she would talk and kind of ramble and she would mention <clears throat> that night, like talking about, you remember when we saw the UFO? Remember the little men? And she was like, she don't remember the little men or anything like that. And that particular person, um, you know, was the one that, that she did. I believe she was the one that was like older than they were, uh, which would have been, that would have been her, that would have been the one that died. Okay. In Liberty Hill, because that was her, her uh, sister-in-law's cousin. And then the other one was somebody that she went to high school with. And, uh, but she, and she's the one that ended up dying of cancer. So then it was just her and her sister-in-law. I think they're both still alive, but she said that, that she would ramble on about seeing the craft and seeing these little creatures or men, whatever. And when she asked the other women, she's like, I asked them multiple times. She's like, I was just walking around Walmart one time and me and my sister-in-law were talking uh, about that night. And she's like, I don't remember any men or anything like that. Um, she's like, I just remember like, next thing you know, we're at my house and you know, I'm going to bed 
you know, and it's like two in the morning and you were leaving. And so, and she had just rode with her to drop them off. That's yeah. what it was. What time did they leave at? Uh, like 8.30 at night. And it was well, like 9 was o'clock when they- She got home at 2 in the morning. Oh, no. She did think it was weird, but she had no answer for it. She said she just don't remember anything. But being there at 2 in the morning, she said that she remembers like them dropping the other ladies off and it being really late. And then later on talking about it. And when they started talking about it and putting two and two together, they were like, what the hell happened? But you got to remember a month before that, her and this particular woman, they saw two werewolf looking creatures, two dogmen, um, both on their hind legs running across the road. That's not a coincidence to me. I mean, you know, I don't think that is. And she, she gave us that story like shortly after it was either when Palacios was on or it was that one fight for your life. I think it was after Palacios came on because she, and she mentioned those at both those episodes. So anyways, she gave me that story and I thought it was interesting. Now, another interesting thing, I talked to somebody, we, remember I said that we were at the UFO conference yeah. and I had inter- I'd talked to a guy named Norman who was there and he, that's not his real name. I agreed to give him, give him a fake name, whatever. Originally, he's from California. He lived, uh, interesting, another thing interesting is Modesta, which we've heard people talk about stuff from that region. He lived near Modesta, California. And when he was a child, he was abducted for the first time at four years old. And it went on and on and on. And when he was 18, he specifically remembers, he came up to me at the conference. <clears throat> and he's like, he goes, I like your show, I like your podcast. I believe I was wearing like a paranormal roundtable uh hat or no no i think nelly was wearing a paranormal round table shirt but uh i I wasn't you know aware of so many people in the ufo community who were into the show whatever and he came up to me says i like your show i like your work and he began telling me all about his encounters and he's and uh, i ended up getting in touch with them and we we talked and this is what he told me he said the the abduction when i was 18 years old was very different than any of the others that had happened before he said, the other ones that happened before, I'd only seen two different distinct species. One was this little troll-looking thing with orangey-looking uh, fur. That's why he called it a troll, because it reminded him of a treasure troll, but very demonic-looking. And they would be hanging out with these grays, these tall, slender, gray beings. And he said that when he was 18, he remembers going outside and seeing these grays kind of waiting for him. And he was walking with them on either side, and he looks to his right, and he sees this. The way he described it was a cross between a wolf and a gorilla. And he said that it was just walking along, and it was like holding this weird, like, wand antenna-looking thing in its hands and was moving it. And there were these metal boxes that were kind of being floated into the craft. And he was told to sit down on them and just be taken taken up into the because he was getting woozy. So he went and he sat down on one of these boxes and just kind of floated into the craft and then he went to sleep. He said he doesn't remember anything beyond that, but that particular incident made him wonder if these creatures were some sort of extraterrestrial. The creature that he, he saw, he described it as having almost like hair like a man on the top of its head with the widow's peak and that it had like a, a big snout and it had big glowing yellow eyes, but it was very uh, canid looking, but the rest of the body was kind of like a gorilla. It was hunched over. It had like the, like a sloped back, you know, um, sort of a ridge going down it by its neck. And it walked and he looked down and he remembers seeing the feet looking very odd, not canid at all, not, not nothing, but like, you know, what we would describe as like a gugwe. And so he said, you know, this thing did not look like the backward bent werewolf legs or whatever. And the feet even looked kind of like how gorilla's feet look like hands almost. Yeah. It looked kind of like that. So that's a very weird encounter. He asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like that. And I said, yes, I have. Not necessarily with all of that, you know, as, you know, and then of course an alien craft with, with alien beings. You know, the, the, you know, quintessential beings, the greys. And of course, you know, I asked him, I said, did you ever, did you ever have, see this creature again? He said, no, I never saw it again. He did though, when he was 27, he said that he, and I believe he was 27 years old. He said, I did see a reptilian looking creature with like a red, 
uh, weird looking like red eyes and like a, a, a greenish, uh, grayish green hue to its skin tone. So that was another thing that was kind of a you know connection between the reptilians and the dog man, I guess. Um, but you know, other than that, I couldn't really, he didn't really give me any more detail. He just, that happened. And, you know, so if you take these stories, you know, and, and you take one of them, you're just thinking, well, this is kind of an oddity, you know, but then if you take them as a collective, you're going like, whoa, you know, there's quite a bit of material here. Um, enough to do like what two shows now, at least yeah. uh, on this subject. And, you know, it can't be overstated that these people are experiencing something that could be, you know, dog men from whatever, you know, you know, Pallades, Zeta Reticuli, I don't know, Alpha Centauri, wherever, um, these, these beings are in earth. I mean, you know, but they're, but they're not your run of the mill dog man encounters. Something's going on. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that Kathy and her sister saw these dog men and a month later they, they are abducted. They're operating in the same area, at least, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like something, there's something to that. So folks, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, thank you for joining PRT. Paranormal Roundtable, and uh, be sure and tune in next Tuesday. Thank you for listening, and good night. <laughs>